Okay, we can as well begin. Thank you for being with us today. Um, we're hosting Mark Devaney and he's going to talk about thinking the limits of populist politics with us today. Um, I will be very short in the introduction uh, of Mark, who himself, himself said that he's a critical theorist. I would stay with that description myself, but then it's not enough for, for a proper description. But since we are talking about improper <laughs> things here, I will be short. So Mark Devaney is a lecturer in contemporary politics and philosophy and leads the program of degrees in humanities at the University of Brighton in the UK. Um, together with other people, several of them, he co-directs the Center of Applied Philosophy, Politics and Ethics. Mark's research covers two primary areas, contemporary political philosophy and improper forms of political action. Um, he is the editor, uh, together with Bob Breher and Aaron Winter, of Interrogating Terror from 2009 and thinking the political, Ernesto Laclau and the politics of post-Marxism, I think it was published this year. It's coming out now. It's coming out now. And he's the author of Ethics and Politics in Contemporary Theory, published twice in 2004 and 2010. Okay. Um, at this very moment, he is finishing the manuscript. He will be presenting today and tomorrow in a way, uh, entitled Towards an Improper Politics, due in 2019 uh, with Edinburgh University Press. Mark, thank you for being with us, and it's really a pleasure to have you here. I'm going to take my jacket off before it starts. It is a little bit warm. Okay, thank you. Um, can you hear me at the back? Does, that, does it work? Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much to Adriana. We had Adriana in Brighton um, 10 days ago, and it was fantastic. We had a great lecture and a fantastic discussion. Um, so it's a great pleasure. I've never been to Belgrade, so thank you very much. Um, I had a walk around the city this morning and got lost. Um, but I enjoyed being lost. It was nice. Um, I'm the, what I'm presenting, it's a really nice opportunity to be here, because I'm presenting two chapters, one tomorrow, and the last chapter of my book today, which is on populism. Um, and what, what I try to do in this chapter are three different things, which I'll speak about during the course of the lecture. Um, the first is to look at the resurgence of right-wing populism and to begin to give an explanation um, of the, or, or not an explanation, but to try and understand what it is right-wing populists reject and how they articulate uh, that project. So that's the first part of the paper. The second part of the paper then begins to ask whether or not we can imagine the possibility of populism as democratic. Um, and in that, I'll be drawing on, but also offering a critique of the work of Ernesto Leclerc. And then in the third section, I very briefly outline what I will call a transnational form of populism. And I use the words transnational on purpose because I'm drawing on queer theory to um, literally queer the idea of the nation and the idea of the people. Um, so I take some tropes from queer theory to begin to think through uh, or to rethink the politics of populism. Um, I know that some of you will be in the workshop tomorrow and you will, uh, I hope if you've seen the work I did on democracy, you'll understand some of the critiques I'm presenting of populism. Um, it's also slightly odd because I spent a fair amount of time working with Ernesto Leclerc, but much of what I've written is a critique of his work. Um, so I feel slightly odd about this, but um, I can justify it by saying I want to be improper. Um, given that the title of the book I'm writing is the improper, towards an improper politics. And I'll, I, I might just begin by explaining which I'll do in more detail tomorrow, why I use this phrase improper. The, 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 the reason I wanted to think about an improper politics is for two reasons. One is my experience of the left. And my experience of the left is of political parties, political organizations, all of which attempt to police the proper bounds, both of theory and of the party. So I wanted to think beyond the tradition on the left, which always knows what's right which always begins from the position that there is a correct line, 
Um, and this, there's a long history of this going back to Lenin's What is to be Done, um, all the way through the various, including the Socialist Workers Party, the Trotskyites, who, who in every instantiation, they always have a committee of people who know, as opposed to those who have to be educated. And um, I wanted to reject this idea of a proper politics. So how can one think a politics of the left and a politics of equality that is improper, doesn't presuppose um, a party or a, an official line? The other, it was very, very straightforward, very simple. Um, the post-structuralist or post-Marxist left forgot about property. Um, if you go back to Marx um, in, the in the 19th century and some of the early Marxists, the debates in Marxism right through until the 1980s, at the center of any critique of, of inequality was the politics of property, um, the means for the production and the reproduction of lives, of which property was one of the central concerns. Um, so I wanted to rethink a politics of property without being stuck in the essentialism that infects ma many Marxist theorists. So that, in one of the chapters which I won't be presenting, I have worked through the logics and the arguments about property um, in order to, to remake and rethink and re-understand property. Um, and I can talk about that at, at, at a later stage. But th those are the two impulses for the book. But of course, one of the things I had to deal with was populism. Because if there is a politics that today is deemed to be improper by more or less every single commentator, it is populist politics. Um, anybody who, everybody who is anybody who studies politics has to at some point write a short condemnation of populism. Um, and they've all done it. Uh, Kas Muda, um, uh, Kaltwasser, a whole range of these people. Uh, they all get it wrong, but nonetheless, they all uh, establish their credentials by demonstrating what's wrong with populism. Um, so in part, I wanted to correct that, whilst at the same time acknowledging the dangers, certainly in Europe, of the ways in which populist politics has emerged. But let me begin with three stories. Um, each of the chapters in the book begins with a story. Um, and I use the stories to, illu to illuminate what I then argue. But I'll tell you three very, very brief stories. Um, one of which you'll be familiar with. In the early 1990s, following the, in, in, well, in the mid-1990s, following the protracted civil war in Yugoslavia, um, Slovenia declared its independence. And at the same time, Yugoslavian citizenship was brought to an end in Slovenia. Um, in effect, if you were a Yugoslav national living in Slovenia, one had to adopt Slovenian citizenship. So in Slovenia, everyone who lived in the territory had to decide whether or not Slovenia was their home state. And this ensured that they could have a passport, registration of birth and death, the right to work, taxation, all of the normal things that go with citizenship. A number of former Yugoslav citizens, however, either refused to adopt Slovenian citizenship or were denied the citizenship. Eventually, those deemed not to be truly Slovenian were simply moved onto a register of so-called aliens. Many of them claimed to be Yugoslavs. They came to be known as the Erased, which you may know about. As a consequence, they suffered at the founding of the Slovenian state symbolic and civic death, and they were erased from the register of permanent residents of Slovenia. Ironically, or very strangely, they could no longer legally die. They could physically die, but legally they could not die. They could not claim property title. They couldn't travel, they couldn't work legally, they couldn't claim citizenship. In effect, they became invisible to the Slovenian state and its functionaries. And there was then, for a decade, a series of disputes about the position of the erased. So the first question I want to ask is, who constitutes a people? How is this decided? How do we articulate the frontiers of what is deemed to be a people? And the founding of the Slovenian state is, is a really interesting instance of this. A second story, much more straightforward. In November 2018, Alex Thompson, a British national 
uh, somebody who lived in Britain but didn't have full citizenship status. He had lived there for 40 years. He had immigrated from Jamaica. He was deemed to be what is called the Windrush generation. Went to his local hospital with cancer. Um, he was diagnosed with prostate cancer and went to get radiotherapy treatment. Now, the National Health Service is free for all citizens. But, of course, if you're not a citizen, a citizen of the United Kingdom, you have to pay for your service. He was given treatment, and as he left the hospital, was given a bill for £54,000. The United Kingdom Home Office said that he could not prove his citizenship and therefore had to buy his health care. Subsequently, he was denied further treatment for his cancer. Um, and the long legal battle ensued. The question that this rose is, again, who counts as of the British people? If somebody has lived in the country for a long time, on what grounds are certain people excluded? And then a third story, and one of the questions I want you to think about as well is not just the people, but what I've called the demos elsewhere. Who, is, who represents the demos in this case? Because in this case, I would say that Albert Thompson is the demos, even though he's an individual. Um, whereas the British people, of whom he's deemed not to be part, act not as if they are a demos. A third story, Latin America. The tradition I grew up in was left-wing populism. This is where, where I learned my politics. Left-wing populism was a critique of orthodox Marxism. It insisted that class was not the basis for determining political identity and that a political project, a left-wing political project, had to be articulated, that is made, that it wasn't given. And the best example of this for, for at least two, two decades were the left-wing populists of Latin America. However, <clears throat> in Latin America, populism depended upon what was called the commodities consensus. And the commodities consensus, in effect, meant that welfare programs, education, infrastructural development for these states depended upon the exploitation of natural resources, including oil, um, soya beans, in particular in the case of Argentina, and a number of other crops. At some point, the Mapuche people from Patagonia, where Cristina de Kirchner, the then populist president of Argentina, was planning some oil, uh, the expansion of some oil fields, the Mapuche people protested. They argued that the Mapuche had indigenous rights to the land, that they were not of the Argentinian people, and that Argentina had no national rights to determine whether or not oil could be exploited from these lands. Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner met with the Mapuche leaders, and this was her response. I quote the actual words she spoke to the Mapuche leaders. You all use telephones. In fact, one of you has just answered your cell phone now. You don't oppose this technology. If, you find, if I find oil in my country, it is better for everybody that we use this oil. Maybe what we have to do is bring our Mapuche comrades to another place which has exactly the same characteristics and conditions. We cannot stop extracting petroleum because we need it for Argentinian development. Um, now, in each of these cases, what is very, very interesting is that the articulation of a national people's project the idea of who the national people is limits the extension of equality to some in the name of extending the equality of others. Okay. In exactly the same way through all of the cases. In the first case, the very notion of the people is put into question at the moment of foundation of the Slovenian state. The contingent articulation and decision of who counts as properly of the people saw 25,000 Yugoslavs rendered stateless and improper in relation to the state. They were, to go back to Hannah Arendt, they were, li they were like those refugees whom Arendt described um, as not, in, the in theory, having rights but not being able to enact their rights in any way. <clears throat> 
Um, in the second case, determining who counts as a member of the British people is used to render some what Agamben calls bare life, zoe, policed as bodies to be excluded from what all other citizens are justified in having. And in the third case, the articulation of Argentinian left-wing populism is premised on attacking and undermining the worldviews, the ways of life, the attitudes to the environment, the epistemologies of indigenous peoples. The decolonial claim in the case of Argentina traces an arc of continuity which links populist nationalism to colonial dispossession. The national populisms of Kirchner and of other Latin American nations were viewed as elemental to the continuing process of colonial dispossession, whilst ironically for the global left, they were viewed as the only alternative to neoliberal globalization. Um, these three examples frame my critique of populist politics, but also my attempt to rethink populism as in some sense transnational, democratic, and improper. They put into question the common leftist celebration of populism. What they also put into question is the necessary link that Ernesto Leclau sees between populism and democracy. Indeed, what this suggests is that the link between populism and, demo and democracy is at very least contingent. Um, and at, at worst, populism leads to the undermining of democratic politics. And we've seen some examples of this which I'll speak about um, in a moment. Um, let me, I'm going to just skip now and turn to understanding the contemporary populist era. How do I understand what's taken place? And this is really personal for me, and I'll, I'll tell you why. In 2014, myself and Paolo Biglieri put in a bid to the British Academy. And the bid was based on a very simple idea. We were going to develop a project about transnational populism. And we were going to articulate what had taken place in Latin America to what was then taking place in Southern Europe in Spain and in Greece, where populist governments and populist parties seemed to be the parties that were beginning to rethink what the future might be. So we were really happy in 2015 when we received the funding for this project. We thought there's no way the British Academy will ever fund a project about transnational leftist populism. And they did, so we were astonished. We had our first meeting in November of 2015 in Argentina. And de Kirchner was then stepping down as president. She'd nominated her successor, and elections took place. And Maurizio Macri was elected to power. Maurizio Macri is, in effect, <laughs> a, a neoliberal um, committed to the financialization of um, Argentina. He's opened up the financial markets. He's closed down all the regulations on trade. He's opened up property, farms, etc., to international investment capital once again, all of which de Kirchner had restricted in the name of a popular democratic politics. But what happened with Macri was perhaps only the beginning of something far worse, um, and we've all seen what these were. Um, in Argentina, in Greece, in Venezuela, Populist politics has been undermined. In America, Donald Trump was elected. In Hungary, in Poland, in Scandinavia, in Austria, in the Philippines, um, in, in India, under Modi, a range of populist governments have been elected to power, not committed to transnational forms of political equality, but on the contrary, committed to forms of populist politics which are racist, discrimi discriminatory, which use gender, sex, and race as the enemy to be opposed as they articulate new forms of national populism. Um, so what I was trying to understand when I wrote this chapter, the first thing I asked myself was, how can we explain this turn? 
What is it that took place? And the obvious, the easy explanation, which people always turn to, is, oh, it's the financial crisis of 2008. So everybody simply turns to that. I've made a different argument, which doesn't preclude this. My argument is that right-wing populism has as its primary antagonist what I call the proprietary order. And what do I mean by proprietary order? I mean a hegemonic logic that links together property, the ways of being proper, forms of behavior, education, a, a range of other factors, what Althusser used to call an overdetermined complex. So a proprietary order, the dominant proprietary order is neoliberalism. However, unlike many critics of neoliberalism, I read neoliberalism not simply as an economic logic. I argue it is also a cultural and a political logic. And right-wing populism responds to the key elements of this dominant logic. What are those key elements? And I'm, if you forgive me, I'm going to read, because I want to be quite precise in articulating these elements. Um, my first argument is that neoliberalism remakes certain of the key demands of the post-1960s left around identity politics. Consistent neoliberals are not racist. In fact, they reject using the contingent properties that individuals may have, race, class, sex, gender, as the basis for discrimination. Instead, neoliberals insist upon the inherent justice of the market, which is not discriminatory in and of itself. I'll come back to this in a moment. Secondly, however, neoliberals accept something which is quite distinct from previous forms of liberalism. They accept that the market is not natural. Foucault made this point originally. They view the state as a mechanism to secure the flourishing of the market. And this sometimes entails active state intervention in markets to secure them against collapse. This is what happened in 2008. This is the biggest state intervention that ever took place in the history of the world. The billions of dollars that were transferred from the tax of citizens into banks in order to continue and maintain the existing political system. So for neoliberalism, the, the, the state's primary role, it's not necessary that it's a small state, but the role of the state is to secure the markers, which sometimes requires active intervention. In other words, the state is not neutral about the markers, but it's neutral about everything else. Okay, this is the logic that, uh, that supports this. Thirdly, neoliberals argue that accounting as opposed to economic logics should be extended to every realm of life. Neoliberals are happy to reframe demands for gender equality on, in terms of accountancy. Wendy Brown's Undoing the Demos sets out the logics which underlie this political rationality. It entails valuing every domain in accountancy and monetary terms. It entails the interpolation of subjects as objects of self-investment. You, you have to invest in yourself. If for those of you who are doing your education now, you've probably come across this idea that doing your education is self-investment. In Britain, students pay £9,000 a year to do their education. The justification the state puts forward is that you are investing in yourself and the investment will pay out in the future. So you will get a return on your self-investment. Um, <clears throat> but it also involves not simply this logic of self-investment, investment, it involves the, in, the invention of accountancy procedures which can measure everything. Neoliberals can thus reject every form of explicit prejudice and discrimination. They can allow for gay marriage. They can engage in anti-racist campaignings. They can give an account in accounting terms of environmental damage. They can insist upon the protection of free speech. Many neoliberals condemn Donald Trump or Rodrigo Duterte. Jemima Repo, for example, has noted how the European Union deploys a commitment to gender equality as a form of biopolitical governmentality. And the way in which the European Union does this is through mechanisms of accounting. 
mechanisms of measurement in which you're answerable constantly for the extent to which you've introduced forms of gender equality. Um, the commitment to gender, ethnic, race and disability rights goes hand in hand then with the deployment of statistical measures to reevaluate the human resource policies of all organizations. This is particularly strong in my organization, the university I work at, where the university is committed to a whole range of so-called equalities charters. The equalities charters give the institution, whether it's a business or a university, a stamp of approval. They say, yes, you are not discriminatory, even while at the same time, logics of discrimination are deployed in all sorts of ways that cannot quite be measured by these statistical criteria. I think Brown doesn't quite get this, in part because of the focus on American versions of neoliberalism. She doesn't quite get the way in which the European Union has deployed accounting logics to rethink a politics of equality. At the, so, so what we get then in this dominant, uh, this dominant version um, of what I've called proprietary order is on the one hand a commitment to markets and on the other hand a consistent commitment to freedom. Freedom of capital, freedom of movement, freedom in terms of gender, freedom in terms of how you want to express your life. Live your life as you wish, but live or die on the markers might be deemed to be the logic that underpins this framing. Now it's interesting that right wing, so, so neoliberalism thus articulates the left's insistence on civil, equal, civil equality and freedom to a market logic which recognizes no prejudices other than your fitness to prevail in a competitive market, which of course then has a set of consequences which depend upon histories of previous prejudice. But those can't be taken into account because the assumption is that the market is equivalent, not equal, equivalent for all. So we get the extension of what I've called logics of equivalence as opposed to logics of equality and the logics of equivalence stand in for logics of equality. Leftist forms of identity politics thus find their denouement in the corporate training manuals and the business manuals which propagate the equivalence of all regardless of the markers of difference and which insist on training their workforce in these forms of equivalence. Now, if, if that's in any sense right, right-wing populism makes quite a lot of sense because it rejects both elements of this neoliberal order. First, it explicitly rejects the extension of the markets to every aspect of life, insisting that the state should intervene in the name of the national people. This may take the form of what's been called welfare chauvinism. In other words, you will get populist politicians committed to the extension of welfare policies in a manner quite similar to the old welfare state, but welfare policies which are chauvinistic. That is, they are only for the true people, as in the case that I spoke about, um, Albert um, Thompson, uh, in the case of the National Health Service in the United Kingdom. It also, however, might mean embracing private sector investment and market politics, but insisting upon restrictive trade barriers and restrictive employment practices, that is, only citizens are entitled to get jobs and others who do not really belong to the nation are excluded. Second, right-wing populists increasingly reject the extension of civil and political liberties to immigrants, to gay men and women, to transnational activists, to feminist activists, to environmentalists and to transgender peoples. So they articulate both elements that are quite central to what in Britain was called the third way. David Cameron, Tony Blair. Okay, you can do what you want, but ultimately you have to live on the market. We have to live within our means. I don't care who you sleep with. I don't care uh, what your color is. I don't care where you come from. They reject that. And at the same time, they reject the commitment to cutting back on the state. They insist on the authority of the state. Right-wing populists indirectly confirm what Nancy Fraser has long insisted. The left needs to challenge inequalities organized around both wealth and identity. 
not simply, as has happened for a long time, certainly in Britain, focus on the politics of identity. In supporting an end, Fraser suggests, to all forms of prejudice, but without extending this to so-called material equality in areas such as housing, income, wealth and property, third-wave political parties prepared the space for the invention of right-wing populists committed to welfare chauvinism and committed to a stronger state. Interestingly, however, neoliberals and neoconservatives do have one thing in common. They both advocate a strong state. They rely on the possibility of seizing sovereign power and remaking the national state on the terms that they wish. Whether this takes the form of the American and British states bailing out private banks with taxpayers' money, or the Hungarian and Polish governments cutting state support to civil society organizations who support refugees and restricting news organizations with liberal or leftist leanings, in both cases, sovereign power is deployed to reinforce logics of inequality. The neoliberal and the neoconservative right thus adapt different aspects of the traditional left's agenda for their own ends. Redistributive policies become for neoconservatives a form of welfare chauvinism, while for neoliberals, civil liberties are articulated to market freedom. In securing these ends, sovereign power won in elections is reshaped, either on terms complicit with the global rules of fair trade, or as a way of policing the proper boundaries of the nation state and the proper boundaries of the people. Um, <clears throat> One last comment about this. Although neoliberalism is rarely characterized as populist, it is important to note that it too articulates an image of the citizen and the people. Good citizens are responsible. They invest in their futures. They don't act as a drain on the resources of the nation. They treat their bodies and their minds as investment opportunities they take on what are called the opportunity costs <clears throat> needed to realize their true potential. And this may range from a variety of practices, from yoga to paying for your funeral before you die. Um, I hate yoga, so apologies to those of you who really love yoga. Um, the, 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 it, yoga has a particular role in the imaginary that I've constructed, which is all about looking after your body and yourself and self-investment, and, and it's generally paid for as well. It's not something that you can do it for free, but, but there's yoga bloody studios all over England. If you ever go, just take a look for them. Okay, the neoliberal, res excuse me, sorry to insult my yogic colleagues. The, ne the neoliberal responsibilized subject there is an abstract ideal in a manner reminiscent of Freud's account of the ego ideal, it punishes the subject which must constantly fail. Um, okay, now in light of that, it seems almost banal, and I don't think I'm saying anything too exciting, it seems almost banal to state the obvious. A democratic politics which is committed to equality needs to reclaim the language of equality from both the neoliberals and the neoconservatives. This means rethinking a politics of material equality as well as the forms of equality organized around identity, lifestyle, gender, sex, and race. But the question we have to ask today, after the coming to power of Macri, of Trump, of a number of others, after the failures of Podemos in Spain and of Syriza in Greece, is whether or not a democratic populist politics is still po possible. And I'm going to suggest, I'm not sure what time we started. Um, excuse me. Um, half an hour. Half an hour? So we half an hour ago. So another 20 minutes, if that's OK. If I haven't put you to sleep already, um, I'll try not to read too much from now on. OK, so, so this, this is how I understand, um, in brief, um, it, I've got a much longer description of this, what I call the neoliberal conjuncture. It's a combination of these two elements. Of course, in different states, the ways in which these two are played out 
will, will take place in different ways, depending upon a set of other factors like religious history, um, the, the way nationalism has been played out, the history of the state, etc. So I'm generalizing. Um, but I think certainly in relation to the European Union and in relation to the British state, this is a more or less accurate description of neoliberal lo logics, as well as of the right-wing responses to what I call neoliberal proprietary order. So the question then is, can, demo can democracy, sorry, can popular, populism be, de be democratic? Now, the way I approach this question is counterintuitive. I don't begin with all the theorists of populism. I ask with a, I begin with a really simple question, the one with which I began the lecture, who counts as of the people? Um, if you read the works of Jacques Rancière, Ernesto Leclerc, um, Etienne Balibar, um, Giorgio Agamben, a variety of other theorists who thought this issue through, they characterize the people in two ways. The people is either everybody who is deemed to count as one of the people, or the people is the oppressed. Um, the, not the, uh, the um, to go back to the Roman phrasing, um, the people and the plebs. The plebs who, in the case of Rome, came to stand in for the people who claimed that they were the true people. Um, it, there's an interesting history about Rome, which I'll say something about in, um, in a moment. Um, but what I want to think is a form of uh, the people, which in English, I'm not sure you, if this translates, in English, there are actually three ways in which the dictionary, if you just begin with the simplest description, the ways in which the people are described. There is, first of all, as the plebs, the oppressed, the excluded, those with no property. That's the first description. The second description is as the people of a nation state, those who are deemed to belong, who are the citizens. And then you have the people, a people. Um, and Ernesto Leclerc will speak about the articulation of the people. But there is a third generic notion of the people, which is just everyone is of the people. People, in other words, in English at least, is a stand-in for all human beings. So within the idea of people, we have these three declensions, but in populist debates, it's only the first two that feature. Um, so I'm interested in beginning to rethink a populism which goes beyond the idea that there is a people, or that we can define the people. I'll talk a little bit about that when I come to the querying of populism in a moment. But let me just take you back to the Roman Empire to give you a sense of this. In Rome, this was played out, these arguments were played out, in terms of what Roman historians called the conflict of the orders. Between 500 BC and 289 BC, there was a struggle between the plebs and those who in effect ran Rome, the, um, the consuls, the wealthy, um, which eventually led in 287 BC to the abolition of debt and to the extension of political rights, the right, for example, to stand as a consul, to everybody who was deemed to be a Roman citizen. But, and that's what the, so when the Roman historians speak about, and when Rancière and Leclerc read the history of Rome, they read this history, this 200-year struggle between the different orders. But there was another struggle going on as well. Because Rome, of course, wasn't just Rome. Rome was an empire. So the third struggle that was going on was from those peoples who had become part of the Roman Empire saying, we are also of the people. This culminates in an edict in AD 212, so 400 years later, the Edict of Caracalla, the then Roman emperor, um, emperor, who declared in one stroke of a pen that all citizens who are free men in Europe are part of the Roman people. 30 million people were granted Roman citizenship overnight. But of course, the Roman Empire didn't stop there. It was still attempting to expand. And the same issues, every time the empire expands, exactly the same questions arise. So the reason I've gone back to this Roman history, back to Herodotus and a set of other historians who write about this, is because there were, in fact, three struggles going on around who is the people. And the last of these is the one I'm most interested in, a notion of the people 
that in some sense is democratic and which always pulls against any established idea of what the people is, which always insists that those who are not of the people should be included as part of the people. Um, somebody else recognized this, um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Um, in book one of the social contract, there is a really lovely moment which political theorists tend to ignore because they're so interested in the general will and the contradictions of the general will. They forget this moment. In two paragraphs, Rousseau speaks about the foreigner. He says, what happens to the foreigner who arrives in the state which has now been convened? And he talks in particular about property. He says, for the foreigner, the property rights which the state has legalized hold no warrant whatsoever. So the general will is justified in protecting these rights. The foreigner is justified because he's not a subject of the general will and thus has no reason why he should recognize the property rights which have been established. And then Rousseau very quickly puts this question aside, the question of the foreigner. Um, but it's a recognition in Rousseau that any constitution of the general will is always subject to this demand that will come from elsewhere. And then the general will has to decide what to do. And indeed, in the case of what Rousseau is describing, we end up with a general will which enforces the equality of the populace against the equality which the, which the foreigner might claim. So I'm interested always in these extra elements outside an established order. Um, and I'm going to turn back to the text now to speak a little bit about this. Um, any constituted version of the people then is always inhabited by a certain impossibility. Once the people is articulated, it can only be maintained if its boundaries are policed. And the maintenance of those boundaries always entails the possible exercise of violence against those who might not recognize those boundaries. I spoke above, for example, of the Mapuche people's struggles in Patagonia. While the Mapuche people's struggle may have appeared to be subnational, that is, below the level of the nation state, in fact, the Mapuche peoples played all three registers against the Argentinian state. They insisted that they were the oppressed minority, the plebs. They insisted that they were a people, and they insisted that they were also just people. So they played all three registers in the argument against Christina and de Kirchner. In this respect, then, I take some distance from Ernesto Leclau's ontological reading of populism and the politics of identification. I won't speak about that here, but it's one of the central claims in the chapter. Leclau insists that a people is the result of articulation through a chain of equivalences, of different demands, different movements, different identities being commonly articulated to a popular front or a popular will. For Leclau, and here I agree with him, the limits of a people is never established in advance of political struggle, and where it appears that the people are established, that always requires forms of policing. The notion of the people is compatible with what Jacques Rancière calls a police order. It always requires on the exercise of antagonistic politics. For the present, however, the only difference I want to insist upon is that the notion of the people also entails a promise. The possibility of imagining a people without exclusion as precisely what dominant elites will always want to prevent. So let me then, in concluding, talk about the queering of the people. Um, and most nation states hate the idea of being queered, which is why I wanted to do this. You can understand why, given that, again, most nation states, um, it's very rare for a nation state not to have at the center of its identity some notion of masculinity and war. Almost every state I've ever come across has this idea. Um, at its center. Um, okay, populism as radical and democratic breaks with the bounds of any established populist, populace. It must be transnational in impulse, and it must very simply reject all forms of inequality, no matter what sophisticated justifications political theorists might present 
in order to justify the limits of the sovereign state. I really hate political theory. Um, not all, but most political theorists prevent really sophisticated reasons as to why the boundaries of the state must be maintained. Okay, it's, it, it's just central to what political theory does. In effect, they are like the town criers of the emperor when he's arriving. Um, political theorists act basically to sing the justification of the state into existence. Um, I, 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 this, this form of opera really upsets me. Um, the idea of a transnational populism stretches populism to its very limits. It contrasts the people with the demos, and it views the demos as a counterpoint to any attempt to limit the people. Okay, I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to speak about, in the closing bit, about the three ideas that link to this idea of a transnational populism. Um, is it possible, then, to imagine a populism which convokes a people without limit? Well, in English it is, because that's what the word already implies. Um, so I'm just going with the words, you might say. Um, one of the reasons I would argue this is absolutely necessary is because the transnational globe already exists. It's changed the world in which we live, and it is hegemonic. Think of the global trade rules and practices. Think of the adjustments that the Serbian state will have to make in order to become part of the European Union. Think of the ways in which wealth and inequality are protected by global rules of what are called fair trade. A democratic populist politics cannot become entangled in national logics, not only because nationalism inevitably limits democracy, but, but secondly, because politically we have no choice if we're committed to democracy, but to begin to engage with the already established transnational order, which severely limits the possibility of nation states acting democratically. Okay, and this is, if, if, you, if you look, for example, at welfare policies in Britain, one of the problems with expanding welfare provision is the agreements that the British state has signed up to in terms of global rules around fair trade. The moment you outsource, for example, state activities, you are comp compelled to offer those state activities to any possible business that might carry them out. Okay, so the state is already caught up in logics, global logics, that limit the possibility of extending this. Okay, so such a notion of the transnational people refuses the easy equation of democracy with a people. But I want to avoid the most obvious problem. Transnational cannot mean simply an alliance of nations. After all, as I've already suggested, it's a fallacy to assume the identity of those nations. Nor can it simply be an alliance of different populist parties from different nations working together. Rather, it suggests the calling into being of what we might think as impossible, a people not defined in national terms. And as I've suggested, before we dismiss this, we need to recognize that we already live in a world that is configured on global terms. Taking our cue from queer theories, we should instead insist that the trans of transnationalism puts into question the easy fit between identity as a citizen ascribed at birth, which interpolates everybody as a member of the nation, and a transnational people, which thinks a transnation, a people struggling with translation beyond nationalist politics. Now, this might seem weird, but if any of you have ever been to London, I walked around Belgrade this morning. The cities we live in are already these cities. The cities we live in are already cities in which people are thinking their identities and their relations to others, other identities in a manner that puts into question their limiting of identity to a national politics. A transnational queered populism breaks with the primordial articulation of nationalism to the nation and to masculinity.
This querying of the nation accords with, the, with Ernest de Laclau's basic insight that there is a radi radical heterogeneity at the heart of all identity. Querying the nation, we should remember the etymology of the word nation. Nation originates in the Latin verb nasci, to give birth. The interpolation which bounds and binds birth to nation is what a transnational populism queers. It recognizes that the institutional, the national labels no longer attach so easily to bodies at odds with communities and nations which desperately try to police their own bounds. It begins to articulate together those practices which disorder the no longer stable body politic in the name of a people without a proper name, which can only be realized as a presupposition that nonetheless much structure our action as Democrats in the here and now. As queer studies quickly established, such processes of disordering can have quite extraordinary effects. We might echo questions posed by these activists. Which laws should apply to which subjects when their forms of identification no longer accord with those presupposed by existing laws existing forms of order? How do the binary distinctions between male and female, or between British and European, for example, how are they combined to police identity, and where do they break down? How do they do violence to the categories which they try to protect? And how, in doing violence, are they already acknowledging that those identities have been queered? because otherwise they wouldn't need to invoke the violence. The violence is already the indication of the fact that the proper bounds are in question, as anybody who's ever tried to cross a border will know. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second two things I'll speak about very briefly is I think we need to rethink sovereignty. At the beginning of my talk, I said that one of the problems is that the neoliberal, the neoliberals and the neoconservatives both use sovereignty as a way of remaking the world. What's really interesting is that the left does not do the same thing. Or when it has done so, it's done so in a manner that redistributes wealth to a limited degree, by, for example, increasing taxation, having social welfare policies, etc. But it's never redistributed sovereign power. So the second aspect of a transnational populist politics would be to look at the redistribution not only of wealth, but begin to think about the redistribution of sovereign powers, both below the nation state, in cities for example, and above the nation state, in order to begin to undermine the extraordinary powers of exception, which Agamben analyzed so well in his little, in Homo Sarka, in the books that came out subsequently, the extraordinary powers of exception which are still vested in the sovereign state. The left, in all but its anarchist forms, accepts with the right that the, that the winning power, seizing sovereign power, is the central political question. This allows for the tax revenues, police powers, bureaucracies. It allows for sovereign, those who hold sovereignty the extraordinary capacity to remake the world. However, electoral politics does not allow, pluralist politics does not currently allow for the remaking of the democratic game. In other words, people like Jürgen Habermas, people committed to liberalism, simply assume that electoral politics are democratic because they allow for different parties to be in power. But what they never challenge is the established forms of sovereign order which those political parties then inherit. And I would argue that a leftist politics needs literally to remake sovereign powers, in part so that when elections are lost, the world is already remade and those sovereign powers cannot be deployed in the ways they've been deployed by, for example, George Bush or Donald Trump um, recently. Now, I know that's idealistic. But I think we once again need to return to the question 
of um, sovereignty. The versions of liberal pluralism which the left has come to accept and adopt are toothless. They do nothing, they change nothing. And uh, if that means I'm not a pluralist, then that's fine. But in fact, I would argue that if we're going to be consistently pluralist, the c being consistently pluralist means pluralizing the exercise of political power. Pluralism today means the concentration of sovereign power, which is then seized by different parties. So you have pluralism of parties, but not a pluralism of power. We need to rethink the re we need to rethink um, sovereign power, the remaking of sovereign power. And last, and I'll just mention this very, very briefly, we need to remake the logics of equivalence that go with global finance. Um, I, I've argued that populism is a form, as a political form, needs to articulate people as equal. What financial capital does is articulate people as equivalent but not equal. So in another chapter of my book, I've reread Marx and the logics of equivalence in Marx without the essentialism that we get in Marx to rethink the politics of equivalence and financial capital as a political project that extends logics of equivalence around the issues of gender, race, etc. at the same time as it extends financial logics of equivalence into every part of life. But this global financial order has to be remade. And I'll just give you two very quick examples. All tax havens should be closed down. It's very obvious, everybody knows this is the case. But the biggest tax haven which should be closed down is the City of London. You probably don't know this. The City of London is an exception to the rules of the sovereign power of the Queen. If the Queen enters the City of London, she has to get permission from the city to enter. The rules that are made in the British Parliament do not apply to the City of London. The rules around taxation, around finance, around the policing and the accountancy of global firms don't apply in the City of London. The City of London has the only unelected member of Parliament. His role, and it's always he, is to sit in Parliament and advise Parliament when they might pass a law that would undermine the autonomy of the City of London. So close down the City of London. What's interesting about this is that the powers of exception exercised by the City of London have their origins in the right of citizens to protest. St Paul's Church, where the protesters occupied, was the only place that a protester could stand at the crosswords, at the crossroads and condemn the king without being subject to the violence that the king might apply. So in ancient times, you could go and stand there, and this was the one place where the law didn't apply. You could say what you want. Over time, the city of London and the financial elites adopted those rights of political exception to create a system of financial exception. Okay? So quite extraordinary, the history is actually the history of the possibility of democracy in London. It becomes the center of... The other thing, and this is something that people, again, are not that aware of, the United States Federal Reserve should be nationalized. Now you might say, that's really strange. Of course the Federal Reserve is nationalized. It's the Federal Bank of the United States. It's not. It's not commonly known that the Federal Reserve is owned by a number of private banks. They appoint six members of the nine-member board. Those six members make the decisions that determine how the Federal Reserve operates. This means that United States economic and global financial policy is controlled by private finance. The decisions that were made in 2008, for example, around who to rescue and who not to rescue were voted upon by some of the very banks that were in need of rescue, which is completely absurd when the Federal Reserve made these. Um, made these. There's a number of other examples I've got, but let me summarize and finish. We need, first of all, I have argued, to understand populism not in national terms, but in transnational terms. But we need in remaking populism to recognize that populism is not the only form of equivalence. There are also logics of financial equivalence, which populists are often responding to.
In other words, a hegemonic populist politics is one which will remake not only how we think the people, it will also remake the global financial infrastructure that supports any idea of what the people is. Secondly, this means that we need to rethink the relationship between democracy and populism. The demos stretches our notion of the people to breaking point, and I would argue that unlike most political theorists, we should not confuse the demos with the populace. It's a mistake that is made repeatedly in the literature, where democracy is assumed to be equivalent to what the people as constituted are. I think it's both a theoretical mistake, but it's also an error that allows political theorists, as I've said, to, to lubricate the wheels of power. Last, I've suggested that we should queer transnational politics and transnational popul populism, pointing to the distance between the ascription and the interpolation of national forms of identity and a new form of identity politics which is transnational in nature, which you find in almost every city of the globe, and which can begin to redefine and rethink a populism which is no longer based on the exclusionary terms of citizenship. Thank you.